moderating today for the first time for this group. So I'm sorry if I, I don't do a good job. I'll try to do a good job. But uh, Marsha is, a, is a tough act to follow. Yeah. And I would love for all of you to introduce yourself in the chat. Um, please let us know where you're based, what kind of students do you teach, what level do you teach, and what do you like about teaching pronunciation warm-up question uh, for everyone. My name is Patrick, and I'm one of the co-coordinators of uh, Top Teachers of Pronunciation, along with Marsha, who's here. Welcome, Marsha and Randy Reitmeyer. They're in actual California. I'm based in Portland, Oregon right now. And uh, before I introduce our speaker for today's presentation, Joseph, I just wanted to remind you that we have a Padlet where you can find information about all the professional development events. So you can look at our Padlet um, and find information about uh, our events and updates on what we've been doing, how we've been engaging our membership. Also, we've set up a newsletter. It's the Top IG mailing list. You don't have to be a Cadizal member to sign up. And if you um, complete uh, this little short Google form for us, uh, we'll be able to send you information about our events. Uh, we promise that we're not going to spam you. We're just going to send you a heads up whenever we host one of these professional development webinars. If you're not um, a Cadizal member, uh, you might consider joining. You don't actually have to be physically in California, which I learned when I moved to Oregon. Uh, there's um, there's a lot of wonderful benefits to, to being part of the, the, the organization from online and in-person conferences to monthly events from all of our interest groups, including uh, teachers of pronunciation. We have a job board. We've got um, a, um, a journal, the monthly Cadizal update uh, journal. So um, I I've loved being a member of Cadizal, and I think that um, my professional practice as, a, as an ESOL specialist has really improved. Thank you. This, thanks to this community. Okay, and without further ado, I would like to introduce today's speaker from the Shanghai University of Finance and Economics, Zhejiang campus. We've got Joseph Schwaller with us today. Joseph, the floor is yours. Okay, hello everyone, and let me share my screen audio as well. Okay, cool. So hello everyone. As you've just heard, my name is Joseph Schwaller, and I'll be talking about purposeful pauses to make speech more powerful. And if we look at our overview for today, um, we'll be talking around, and I'll say five, 10 minutes for my introduction, talking about my student population, um, my research, and looking at how I use super segmentals in the classroom. Oh, let me make sure this is full screen. There we go. And then I'll spend around 30 to 40 minutes where I talk about the activities that I use with my students. So my goal for today is to give you all videos and scripts that you can then immediately use in the classroom later today, tomorrow, or even any time in the future. So I really want to look at some activities. And then if we have time, we'll practice and we'll look at some of my student videos where my students are um, participating in class and we'll see how they handle these activities. So I have been working at this school for around three years now. I spent around two and a half years working online and I'm now currently here offline in China working with my students. The classes I teach are oral English both one and two. I teach a survey class about different English speaking countries I teach business English, um, I have an English corner, and a public speaking class. So a lot of our focus is on how can we be clear in a business setting? How can we be clear with presentations, speeches, um, in meetings, and so on? So we focus a lot on communication. 
making sure what we say is clear for this for these genres that we're looking at. Now, my age group is college, 17 to 21 years old. And I have two main um, levels for their speaking and their listening. So for oral English, these are English majors. So they're low or mid intermediate. And for my business students, they're mid or high beginners. So what I've done with these students is we look at everything using IIC, which is where I have students identify using the scripts and the videos, a specific sound. Then we spend time imitating and using that sound in the classroom. And then from there, they start creating using that sound. And we'll see student examples as well later. So all of this started because I wanted to know for my speech competitors of how do people organize their ideas? I couldn't figure out how they organized it because even though they said things a certain way, they had signposting, I couldn't exactly tell where they were breaking their ideas or what they were doing during these competitions. So I started asking myself, what are they doing? If I take what they're saying and throw it into Pratt, can I find what they're doing? And I found that pauses are so important to communication. And I started looking at competitions, presentations, and just casual conversations and seeing how do people break what they're saying and put it in the parts. So now with my students is we focus a lot on pauses because they act as the scaffolding for focus words, for gestures, for making what they want to say clearer and easier to understand. So I found that there are these three types of pauses when I look at um, different competitors, different speakers in general. Well, they have a short pause within their sentences, medium pauses between sentences, and the long pause showing there's a shift in their ideas. And I'll show you how I show this to my students later as well. So when I was doing this research, I found that pauses help break part, break everything they say into clear parts, such as the introduction, body, and conclusion. But I also found that sometimes people will say, this is the next idea, but their pause isn't long enough. So it almost gets hidden where they can't, where people can't hear what they're trying to say next. So this then led to me wondering, okay, I found that pauses are important. So how can I use this in the classroom? What activities can I do? How can I help my students be clear? How can I, when I use Pratt, it helps me, but how can I help my students use this app as well to start seeing what are super segmentals? How can we be clear when we're speaking, either casually or in a more formal setting? So I started to expand how I use pauses in the classroom. And again, when I look at my students, they're business majors, so business English majors, or just English majors. So are they business majors, business English? And they're all at different levels. So some of my students, when they're speaking, they, can, they have difficulty making a sentence. So we start at the beginning and seeing, okay, let's look at basic sounds, segmentals, and work our way up into super segmentals so that we can start making what we say clear. And I have a big focus on noticing where my students go from not knowing any of this. They don't know what a pause is. They don't know what word stress is. They've never been taught it before. To after just a few weeks, they can start hearing, oh, that's what's important. That's the idea. That's what I need to do. And we'll start seeing that too in some of the student examples that I want to share as well. So I wanted to see how I can add this to my class. So I focused on the IIC, which is identification, imitation, 
and creation. So all of my activities in my class, which I'll show you today, and we'll share with you as well, the videos and the scripts, focus on identifying, finding the sound, then imitating the sound, practicing and taking how that person says it and using it as well. Then creation, where you take how that person um, communicates and you use it in your own language. Either it's scaffolded, um, it, well, they're all scaffolded, but either it's very guided to where I give them more of a clear outline of this, these are the parameters you work in, or I give them a free activity where they just create and there are no parameters, where there's a higher chance for mistakes, but now they're using all of their own language rather than some help from myself. So this is a process of how I make my activities. First, I'll find a video, a TED talk, a TV show, a competition video. Sometimes I take clips from TV shows. Um, if students like a certain actor, we can pull up a video of the actor speaking, and then we can see, okay, when is this person pausing? When is this person getting louder? What's the important word in what he's saying or what she's saying? And then I'll show them a script of that as well. Sometimes too, is I'll take Pratt and I will say or record my own voice into Pratt and show my students what's happening with the language and they'll try to imitate or mimic how I say it or how other people say it. And they try to imitate or copy how that person is speaking. Then this leads to, once I've found a really good um, example, the TED talk or the video, I'll have students identify the sound using what I call these smaller sized activities, which I'll show you some as well. Then we imitate and then we create. So let's look at some of these smaller sized activities, which I usually give a script and a video along with it. So if we look at this, one of my favorite activities to do is my Pratt visualization with a pitch scale. So let me show you guys what that looks like. Okay. So what I do with my students is we'll start small with just one word group and I'll show them this sentence. I want to eat a hamburger or I want to eat a hamburger. And I'll say it in different ways. I want to eat a hamburger. And we look through and we count together. How many syllables do we have? I want to eat a hamburger. And we talk about, oh, we have eight syllables. And I give them this little chart of how loud we want to make each word. So they can see and play with the language. And I'll ask for people, how high do we want to put the word I? So if I were to ask you guys, where should we put I in, I want to eat a hamburger. So for example, Anne, where would you want to put I? I want to eat a hamburger. I would put it at a lower, medium, low spot. Mm -hmm. So which number? Oh, two. Two? Okay, so I'll put it right there. So thank you. And then let's look at Kristen. Where do you want to put want? How about three? Three? Okay, so do we want to put this right next to I? Or do we want to put it a little bit away? I want to eat a hamburger. How close do we want that? I would I say want pretty, to eat a hamburger. Pretty close. Pretty close. Okay. So we'll make sure it's close enough, but not perfectly touching. Okay. Let's hear from Carla. Where should we put two? I think probably one. And do we want it by itself? Is it two or is it part of the word want? Part of it. Yeah, because it becomes wanna. Mm -hmm. So now we're putting that together. Okay, thank you. Let's see. Um, Marik. 
Oh, uh, hi, yeah. Joseph. Hi. hi. So where do we want to put eat? I want, I want to eat. Eat is, is, is low, let's say round about one. One? You want to put it down here? But I would also put want lower than three. I would say I want to eat a hamburger. So I wouldn't go up with want. You see what I mean? Yeah. So and, the, it would be in line with want, eat. I okay. want to eat a hamburger. So that's what my uh -huh. uh, numbers would be. And where would you lower. put two? Can you put it lower than, than two? Yeah. Just at one. Uh -huh. No, and where would you lower. Lower? Okay. And where would you want to put two? Oops. I want to. A little bit. Yeah, where it is now. You want it to be higher than one? No, this is okay. Okay. So right now you have two higher than one. So I wanna eat a. Wanna eat a. Yeah, I want to eat a. Yeah. Okay. But eat can be a little bit closer to, to two, can it? Okay. So we can put that closer. I want to. But then I needs to be a little higher than two. Okay. So you want this to be even higher? I want to eat a hamburger, yeah. Okay. That's and my see... uh, rendition of it. <laughs> sure. And let's hear from Marsha. I see your hand is up. I wanted to be sure that I understood the prompt, the mm -hmm. stimulus. I understood you not to ask how we would say it. Mm -hmm. I understood you to analyze what we heard. Yes. And using that information, it's about audio analysis of what mm -hmm. we heard yes. and your example in which case it could be very different yes. from the intonation pattern of an individual idiolect yes and so what i do with my students is after we go through this i let them put whatever they want in the class they discuss and they go oh no that should be higher that should be lower then i show them what i heard and I show them what I heard. So we compare what the students come up with. Can they hear differences? How, um, if they think, well, this is how I say it, then we talk about, okay, so you say it this way. How does this person say it from the audio? And sometimes I'll usually use my own voice as well. And then we look at that and I show them this. And then I'll use Pratt and I want to see. Having some difficulty zooming out for some reason. And then I show them this. And we talk about how we have these different levels of sounds where it goes up. I wanna eat a hamburger. And I show my students how the sounds actually look. And my students say that just seeing this can help them see oh, these are how the sounds differ. They can see which words or which sounds kind of mesh together more. Like want to, they'll usually say, I want to eat a hamburger. And then as we're practicing, we see, well, want to becomes wanna. And you see it goes up and wanna. And then we go, eat a hamburger. So they start seeing how the language changes from a visual point. So for myself, I'll use Pratt so I can see which words are actually the focus word because sometimes I'll hear something and think that's the important word, but then I use Pratt and I'll see it's different. Or when I look at Pratt, I can show my students what is being used as well. So that's one of my activities that I use with my students is we do this pitch example. And one thing I wanna do now that it's physical is I want to take this and I want to make laminated cards so students can play around and say, oh, I want this to be really high. One year I had a student say, I want this all the way at eight, all the way up here. And I asked them, okay, how would you say that? How would you make it that loud or that high? And we played around with the language just to see if they could make these different um, sounds, this variation. So what I want to do now is we'll look at another activity, which is my script and video activity. So what I do with my students, and I, you'll see this too from my student examples, 
is I will take one of my scripts. So for example, I will take this one here. And this is a longer one. So I use this with my more advanced students, the intermediate level students. But I also have scripts that are shorter. Like if I take this one right here, this is a shorter script for 30 seconds. So depending on if it's the longer, more advanced students or the lower level beginner students, I'll take a script just like this. And this script has no pauses marked. It does not have word stress. It does not have focus words. It's just a blank script. So what I do is I'll go through the script and I'll ask students to mark down when they hear a pause. So they mark them when they hear a pause. And then I ask students to practice saying what they heard with their partners. And as we go through, we'll talk about pauses and how they're different. So we start with a blank script and we're just identifying. We start with the first I, identifying. And they tell me where they hear the pauses, they practice it, and then I ask them, where is a longer pause? Where is a shorter pause? And how are they different? What are they doing? And my students will talk about why they think there's a pause somewhere. Like, why is there a pause here? How do they know there's a pause here? How do they know there's a pause here? And what are they doing? What are these pause doing? Are these pauses just separating ideas? Or are they saying, this is one main idea, then there's another main idea? And we look at this. So if I show you an example of the blank script, and I show you one of my example videos, which I'll share these with you as well. So if you like these scripts, I have a few of these where I write down where the pauses are. I write down where the focus words are, where I've found them. And I ask my students, which word's the loudest word? And then I find in Pratt, so I know which one's the loudest word. So I know as a teacher, oh, these are the loudest words. Then I can ask my students what they think are the loudest words. And I know which ones they should be. So there's no, well, I think it's this one while I'm doing it because I know which ones are the loudest words. And I'll show you how I find that in Pratt as well. But then I also look at gestures. So what people are doing when they say the focus word. So for example, we're going to see this speaker and he says about my errors in my values. So when we have these focus words, we're also moving with what we're saying. And so we go through all of these parts. So when we look at this is I want my students to identify, and this usually takes just the pauses will take around 20 minutes, just going through pauses. So if you want an activity that will last you 20 minutes where you're identifying, you're saying, these are the pauses, let's watch the video, write down your pauses, then imitate with a partner, and then we discuss, that takes around 20 minutes. Then for my classes, they are 80 minutes long, two parts with a break in between. So then we also have time for focus words, but if we don't, we move this to the next week. So it's our activity for the next week where we look at, again, the speaker's video, and then we look for what are the loudest words, those focus words? And then how do the people move when they say it? So let's look at an example of Kaifuli so you guys can see what the video would look like. So with this activity, we go through it a few times. Now, I want to try this activity with you guys, if I can share the script. And what we're going to do is what I do with my students, where I give them a block, either like this, or like I said before, with the other one, where I give them a larger block. And we just see, when is the speaker pausing? And what we think the speaker is doing. 
So with the script again, I just want you to listen for when the speaker stops talking. So just like I do with my students, when do you hear a pause? So let's go, it, go through it one more time. Usually, because when I did this online, I would have students mark into right. the Word document. And then I would just, they would mark it and I would ask them, such as this, I would go, okay, John, when do you hear the first pause? And they would go, oh, uh, after two. And I go, okay, does anyone agree that the pause is after two or should it be somewhere else? And then students will usually either say it or they'll write down in the chat, no, 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 not there, not there. Or yeah, yeah, after two is fine. And then students, I'll ask them, okay, where do you think the next pause is? And then we can also talk about, okay, why do you think we have a pause here? Or why is, what is this pause here doing? Or what is this pause doing? Is it separating an idea or separating just words and phrases? And then I students talk about it. And then once we fill this out, they are then given a few minutes. I'll put them into breakout rooms and then they practice with a partner. Then after a few minutes of practicing what we've made, I ask some students to practice to the class so we can hear that. And then after we figured out where the pauses are, then we'll go through and I say, okay, now that we've found the pauses, let's listen for the loudest words in each group. So I want to try this as well. And you guys can raise your hands when you guys hear. So it's like, raise your hand when you hear a pause and we'll go through that. I'm going to talk about how AI and mankind can coexist. But first, we have to rethink about our human values. So let me first make a confession about my errors in my values. It was 11 o'clock, December 16th, 1991. I was about to become a father for the first time. My wife, Shen Ling, lay in the hospital bed, going through a very difficult 12-hour labor. I sat by her bedside but looked anxiously at my watch. And I knew something that she didn't. Okay. And I see someone has the raised hand emoji too. Do you have a question, Dean? Or is that just because you heard a pause? Okay, okay, okay. So with pauses, I usually ask students when they hear the pause, and then I'll do the hand thing with focus words, with focus words, because that they'll go, okay, now we have the pauses. We know exactly, they've discussed it. I really like negotiation, where, where do you think the pauses are? Where do you hear the pause? And then other students can chime in and say, no, 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 not there, not there. Or yeah, right there, right there. And then we go through with these focus words. Now, I don't show my students this part. I don't show this to them. I only show them this part with the pauses once we've made it. And then I ask them, where do they hear the focus words? Now, you could show them this part, and that's why I'm giving you the scripts. And I'll give you guys three examples. I have three, uh, two TED Talks, and I have a competition video that are marked very extensively like this. But I'll also be sharing things such as this, where I will give you guys the script of a speaker. And then you can choose which parts to use. If you want to talk about this part, you can, with every single pause marked and how long they are. So I'll be giving you guys all of these scripts along with the videos. So you guys can go, oh, cool, let's do this next week. And you can immediately start using any of these videos and scripts together. So when I'm working with my students, this is part of a larger activity. And I want to show you guys, which is my medium sized activity. So I start with identification and imitation. Can they hear the pauses and can they use it? Then we do this every week. So we have Kai Fu Li, Ashley M. Grice, and then a contestant from China. So they have a student who's just like them, and they can imagine themselves giving these presentations. Same L1 Chinese, just like them, 
same kind of outfits they'll wear during their competitions. And they get really excited seeing, oh, whoa, people just like me can do this as well. So we identify and imitate. Every week we'll look at one week it's Kai Fu Lee for 20 minutes, one week it's Ashley for 20 minutes, one week it's in a contestant. Then they choose their favorite speaker and they have to listen for when they hear the focus words or listen for, and watch where they see the gestures. So we'll practice a bit in class, but I don't give them the answers because I want to see, can they identify here when the pauses are, the focus words? Can they see when the person is moving and how? Then they come to class and they do what they've heard. So everyone will sound different or move differently because people will hear different things or they'll see different actions based on the videos. So after three weeks, we then do this activity. And I wanna show you guys what my students did this week on Monday, because I wanted to show you guys a student example, well, two student examples. And I asked them on Monday if I could record them because we were doing this activity in class. So in my business class, they are all beginners. Their spoken English and their listening levels are both um, mid-beginner or high beginner. So they need a lot more practice because this is English as a foreign language. They're really good at writing, they're really good at reading, but they need more pronunciation practice. So I have two students here and they both chose Kai Fu Lee. So I want you to listen and see, and try to think of feedback you would give for pauses, focus words, or gestures, how they move. So what do they say that's clear? When do they pause that could use more practice? Or when they are using a focus word, are there some words that aren't very clear? And we'll listen to one speaker first, then we'll listen to the second one. And again, this is after we've done three weeks of identification and imitation in class. Now they're imitating in class for a grade. I'm going to talk about how AI and McCann can coexist, but first, we have to rethink about our human values. So let me first make a confession about my areas in my values. It was 11 o'clock, December 16th, 1991. My, uh, I was about to become a father for the first time. My wife, Shalene, lay in the hospital bed, going through a very difficult 12-hour labor. I sat by her bedside, Look, I look anxiously at my watch and I knew something that she did it. Okay. So what are some things that he did well? What are some things that you would say he needs to practice? So do we have any volunteers that want to talk before I call on people? Sure. Um, yeah, I think he did a pretty great job um, pausing in most of the right places if not all of the right places. Mm -hmm. um, something, uh, some feedback that I would give to him is that um, this, uh, another thing that he did really well actually was um, uh, nailing the pitch of um, the, the stressed syllables in mm -hmm. uh, focus words. Um, but I like to remind my students that something that we pretty much always do in stressed syllables of um, focus words is actually stretching the vowel. Yes. And I feel like that um, his vowels haven't been long enough. So like when he's stressing words, um, he, he makes the necessary pauses and uses the right pitch contours, but maybe not stretches the stressed syllables in those vowels. Yes. And with my students, we talk about making them we go louder and we hit the ground as loud as we can. We go louder, we go longer, and then we go higher. And I, I try to make them raise their bodies up when we go higher or lower. So low, high, and I, I kind of get them to try to make different sounds because their native language, they don't 
jump between sounds like that. They don't go high of the high to low of the low. They're usually going just more flat, where it's the syllables are more similar. So for my students, this is some of the first times they've ever done this, where they've never made sounds longer or louder or any of that. And Randy, you have a question or feedback. Yeah, I was going to give a comment about something else the student did. And it relates to your point about you know, jumping from high to low more abruptly the way we do in English. So it, a couple of focus words were uh, my errors in my values. And I felt he kind of glided a little bit down from mm -hmm. my to air to errors, but he didn't make that more abrupt jump that I would try to coach students to do. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Does anyone else want to give feedback before we look at the next speaker? I would say that for someone that you said is a beginning learner, that you've done a terrific job in teaching him uh, the necessary skills to get through all of the words and sentences, to put the pauses in those places, and to use his intonation patterns over each of those phrases. I think that is um, great progress. So kudos to you. Thank you. Well, kudos to him more that he's really putting the time and effort into it. That's why I really like my students here. Yes. Um, we're going to look at another one. So let's hear from one other student. And again, you're looking for pauses, focus words, those loud words, long words, higher pitch, and you're looking for gestures, how he's moving. I'm going to talk about how AI and mankind can coexist. But first, we have, we have to rethink about our, our human values. So let me first make a confession about my errors in my values. It was 11 o'clock, 1916, 20, 2021. I was about to become father for the first time. My wife, Shilin, lay in the hospital bed, going through a very difficult 12 hour labor. I sat by her bedside, but looked anxiously at my watch, and I knew something that she didn't. So any feedback for the second speaker? Yeah, Carla. Saw your hand go up. Yeah, um, he he was definitely a lot more choppy than the other student. Um, mm -hmm. His pauses uh, would tend to fall um, often in the wrong places, mm -hmm. and perhaps maybe it was nerves or trying to remember what he was saying. But he didn't have it down quite as smoothly. And I also noticed too. Um, that he would put the stress perhaps maybe um maybe not so much on the wrong word but in in the wrong way like he would say bed um kind of you know carrying that up so mm -hmm. so he tended to struggle a little bit more yeah and going back to that word stress that you were talking about when he talks about a 12-hour labor he makes 12 an hour he squishes them together and makes them twar, twar labor. And it becomes difficult to hear, well, what kind of labor was it? Because what's a twar labor? So he was so focused, for me, he was so focused on making that word louder that he kind of ate the words before. And that's something we would talk about where we have these content words or these important words, not focus words, but still important, that they need stress as well. Um, but words like um, to or the will reduce. And so he tried to reduce so much that he took some important information and made it very difficult to hear. And he does that twice, I've noticed, at least, with two hour, and he does it earlier as well. What other feedback do you guys have for him? Yeah, Marcia. Well, he seems as Carla noted, less proficient to begin with, and his choppiness um, is something that elucidates that part of his 
is also he seems more nervous in his body language and so you're asking you're you're asking the students to do both verbal and mm -hmm. nonverbal behaviors yes and so it's quite difficult it's a very difficult task if he were simply recording his voice mm -hmm. and not having to do the body language as well yes. i mean the other guy's body language wasn't perfect either but it was smoother it was more fluent but i think kind of went along with the ability to make the pauses in the correct, correct positions yes. and not in the positions where in the places where for example this speaker did and you can see him rocking from his left to his right foot and, yes. you know things like that so the body language part is something that uh, can be developed at some point but that may yes. not be the main thing that you want to have them do now so yes. um, I was wondering if you especially wanted them to do both verbal and nonverbal simultaneously or if yes. you thought about or had them do any separation yes because um during the in-class imitations they do um just the verbal we're not looking at gestures yet they're just doing okay so we found pauses let's um, practice these pauses let's practice which words are louder and we usually spend 20 minutes for just pauses going through the video and everything and then over three weeks we're focusing a lot on the pauses and the focus words then we also start looking at gestures at the end where they have to find gestures and they have to find a lot of the focus words. So we spend around three weeks doing just the verbal and then we start incorporating some nonverbal as well, which is what they're doing now, where this is their first time really doing the nonverbal. But they've had time looking at the nonverbal. That's right, they've had time looking at the verbal, not as much time looking at the nonverbal. Could you tell us how many hours do you meet with the students and how often? Yes, we meet uh, once a week for 80, um, not 80 hours, once a week for 80 minutes. So we have 40 minutes, then we have a break, then another 40 minutes. So since this one is a business class, we spend the second half of class on pronunciation, oral communication. And then the first part of class is the writing and the reading portion. Do you have a certain length of your term? Yes, 16 weeks. So these students I have 16 weeks with. My How many oral students? English, um, for this it's 30, but sometimes I have upwards to 60 students for business. So how do you get them all done in class? So usually for 60, we'll break it up into different days where they'll be presenting on different days. When it's 30, we do it together with the 30 second um, communication and we spend the whole 80 minutes with the students where we talk, it's 30 seconds per student, they go up and we give feedback as a class and then we go to the next speaker. Um, this time we had around 30 students. We got through 20 and we got through 25 and then five of them were sick. You really line them up. Yes, uh, I try to get them excited for it to because it's language that they've not learned before. It's They've never practiced the oral pronunciation. So to them, it's this is an entirely new field. It's something where they're going through something they've never even heard before. So these are my non-English majors. These are business majors. These are cute. That's cute. That's great. And then my business English majors, the ones who are focusing to be teachers, they're focusing to be um, interpreters, they're focusing on being translators uh, for the business field. They, since they're English majors, we focus more on really getting to the nitty gritty and we spend an entire 16 weeks on pronunciation um, for the English majors because I have them for a year. So we spend around Sorry, 10 weeks, then 16 weeks. So we spend 10 weeks for the English majors on let's really get into segmentals, super segmentals, and get into the nitty gritty of how does pitch work? How can we do rising tones, falling tones? How can we really elongate the words or shorten the words? We spend a lot of time there. But for my business students, um, we focus on half the class's pronunciation. So around now, it's been five weeks of our class 
So this is the fifth week when they're doing this activity. And then in two weeks, they're going to do a shadowing, which I wanted to talk to you guys about as well. And let me show you guys the shadowing activity. So we have a shadowing activity where now that they've practiced this, um, the students have practiced this, they've um, taken what another speaker has said and they've imitated it. Now they're going to create a product and then they have to present their product to us for one minute. And they're going to be um, graded more on how clear um, the comprehensibility and intelligibility of how clear are their focus words? Are they pausing um, in a way that makes it easier to understand what's important? Or are they over pausing? And they're going to be graded on that. And I'll show you guys an example. And I'll share these with you as well. So here are four scripts that come from a website called Pitchforce. So I listened to what they say. I broke them down in the parts using Pratt. So I could see, oh, they're, this is their main part. And I know because they have a long pause right at the end. So I broke them into parts. And then the students can use these as examples for when they make their own products. And why I do this is Pitchforce is a website where you have a panel of investors and someone from a company, a representative will say, this is my company and I want investors. It's like Shark Tank if you know a Shark Tank, but without the television portion, not the entertainment portion. And since my students are business students, I want them to listen for how do these speakers, who some are non-native speakers, how do native speakers and non-native speakers use pauses? How do they use focus words? And even during the six, um, not six week, but even during after five weeks or six weeks, going by what I did last year, students start to hear the focus words. They may not understand all the other parts, the, the other words, but they'll listen and go, oh, he's talking about something that's an enormous, an enormous something, like a huge something. And they can hear the focus word because they're beginning level. And we look at these pitch force videos and I'll show you an example. Um, so we're going to look at Samir. And if we look at Samir's script, we have it broken down into three parts. And if I show you guys Samir's video. So that's just an example, just 30 seconds of the example where we go through this as a class and we see how do these people talk about their companies? How do they organize ideas? What words are the loudest words? And it's more difficult than the TED Talk because they're trying to cram an entire company into one minute. But my students, I ask them, what are the loudest words? And I'll give them the script. And when they look at the script, they start hearing, oh, he's focusing on these words over here. Or if we look at another speaker, they, I used this one in class the other day, and they'll go, yeah, we can hear that she's focusing on a lot of negative effects. So she's focusing on the amount of effects. And when she talks about uh, these huge problems right here, a huge need, she goes, there's a huge need. We see that as well. So these really help my students. And again, I'll be sending these scripts to Marsha along with the videos. So she can send these out and you can go, we're gonna use this one right now in my class. And my goal is that you guys leave having these um, lesson plans or these, these activities for your lesson plans ready to go. And I know we only have around five minutes left. Or do Thank have... you so much, Joseph. Yes, yeah. I think yeah. now would be a good time to move on to our Q and A. Yes, and let me just jump to that. The rest was just the same stuff of like, these are my activities in more detail. So yeah, we can do the Q&A then. And let me stop sharing my screen. Okay. So anyone, if you have questions, um, unmute yourselves or raise your hand, however you want to go about it. Um, and please ask them to Joseph. 
I, I don't have a question, but I just want to make a comment that um, I love your activities. I love the creativity of it. I love the practicality of it um, and how you're really using, um, you know, uh, research-based kinds of um, techniques and activities uh, in a scaffolding kind of manner. So i um, really impressed. Great job. Thank you. I have a quick question, Joseph, about Pratt. Um, sure. Do you also have the students record their own version of these sentences that you've showed, showed, shown them and um, analyze their pronunciation in Pratt and compare it to, um, to a model? That's what I've been wanting to do starting this year or next year. Because now that I'm here physically, I can just pull up Pratt and show it right there on the big screen what we're doing. Um, when it was online, I was more worried that the lower level students um, that are in my class, well, I'm on the phone, so they can just go boop and not, they can just cover the phone when I'm talking about Pratt of how to use it. And I was really worried that if, when I showed it to my more advanced students, they all loved it. They were like, yes, let me play with Pratt. I love this. But I was worried that since I'm on the phone, it might get lost in communication. But now that I'm here physically, um, when I'm working with my students, they kind of perk up more because they're like, oh, he's finally here. It's been three years online. And when we look at Pratt, I can just show them, okay, this is exactly what we're doing. Show them everything. And I can even have students come up and I can have them record and show it right on my computer because Pratt has the audio recording where you just talk into it and we can play with it that way and show it. So it's a lot faster. So I didn't do it online, but it's something I want to incorporate into my physical classroom because then I can say, okay, let's come up and show how your voice looks compared to the, um, the original speaker. And that's something I do want to incorporate. Yeah, let us know how it goes. <laughs> Maybe that could be a follow-up presentation. Um, do we have any other questions? Yeah, Randy, I see. Yes, thank you. You know, uh, this may be kind of an impossible question, but I was really impressed that you're teaching the students how to do the gestures along with the prosody. And I just wonder if you notice any kind of um, jump in improvement in their rhythm or in their ability to stress focus words after you've introduced the pauses as part of the performance. I've noticed for some of my students is they do start going oh yeah, because I want to move my hand to when it's important. So you'll see some of the students, they'll start moving to when they think something's important. But some of my students, and I've talked to, I'll talk to them about it, is they'll just go, and today I'm going to talk about how everything is going. And I go, you can't just use it randomly. You have to use it when something's important and you, you have to have a reason for it. If you're saying there are a lot of people well, this does not mean a lot. This is like fewer. So we talk about this idea. One of the speakers, Kai Fu Lee, he goes, coexist, coexist. And he makes it larger. And I have the students, we all do the motion. We say, okay, if I want to say there are many people, what would you show me? And I'll have students do different actions, different movements. So then they can start practicing. Oh, maybe I want to shorten or make it larger. One speaker I didn't show you is he goes, we need to rise and fall, advance and retreat, win and lose as a whole. And that one speaker does that. And I really push this idea of when something's loud or important, we're going to move either our face, our eyes, or if it's really important, we're showing that as well with our body. So some students will really get that and they go, yeah, okay, my errors and my values. And they start seeing that in their language, that change. Some students, they'll just this for a while until it slowly improves. But yeah, that is something I try to be aware of with my students. Yeah, just as a comment, you know, I've never tried to teach gestures or any kind of body language along with um, prosody or any pronunciation, but it seems like the students that really rush through their syllables would kind of be slowed down a little bit if they were taught mm -hmm. to make these you know, purposeful gestures that take a little bit more time to make. Yeah. Thank you so much for your question, Randy.
Thank you, Joseph, uh, for your wonderful presentation. Uh, super informative. I really loved all the practical activities. And uh, thank you to all the participants for um, uh, for taking part in those activities. Um, I forgot to mention that we do have a Facebook page um, for Top IG. So that, that's another way to get in touch and stay up to date uh, with um, our activities. I put a link to the Facebook page um, into uh, the chat. Our next event is coming up on April 21st. Um, we're going to share with you um, some details on what's happening soon. Next event, April 21st, but you can already um, save the date in your calendars. So thanks again to all the participants. Thank you so much, Joseph. Really loved uh, this event. And I hope everyone um, has a great weekend, a well, wonderful rest of your uh, Friday. Take care, everyone. Thank you very much, Joseph, and all the participants as well.